Well, good morning, house family. Oh, it is so good to see you good-looking, stud muffin, stud ants. Just a bunch of good-looking people. Man, y'all, I feel better looking just looking at y'all, you know? <laughs> I love Sundays, man. It's just, it's the time that I get to see everybody at one time and get to hug you and kiss you. I mean, just hug you and shake your hands. And just to tell you I love you, and I'm so honored to get to be part uh, of the House family. Well, hey, we are continuing our discussion today on what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. And if you'd go ahead and turn in your, ba- your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Again, if you, if you missed last week, one thing I've started asking our church to do is start bringing a physical copy of the Bible. We are a very digital church. We, I've digitized everything, and there's nothing wrong with the digital Bible and things like that. I just feel like for a season, God wanted us to, to, to limit distractions, uh, to put our phones on airplane mode, and to just get back to flipping through the pages. And also just want to remind you, if you don't have a Bible, uh, on behalf of the men and women who give here at the House Church, we would love to give you a Bible. Uh, Again, if you don't have one, if you stop by our VIP booth, we would love to bless you with a physical copy of the Bible. But in Matthew chapter 4, we see Jesus here. He started his ministry, okay, and he's going around looking uh, for somebody or looking for people who's going to help him change the world. And he actually comes to these two brothers, and he actually mentions these two words, follow me. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4, again, verses 18 through 20. And here it goes. It says, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, let's read this together, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed Jesus. So what we define a true follower of Jesus is as a disciple. A disciple is somebody who lives according to God's word and God's ways. And then that we are called to duplicate ourselves as well. We know that as the Great Commission, we see this in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Uh, You don't have to turn there. You can reference or if you're quick enough to turn there. But Matthew 28, he starts off by saying this. This is after he was crucified on the cross. He was put in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the grave. He resurrected, and there are over 500 eyewitnesses that saw Jesus. And right before he ascended, he brought his disciples together, and this is what he said. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey, everybody say obey, Obey. all that I have commanded you, meaning that they're not an option. That's a command from Jesus to command, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of time. So we know that is what God has called us to do, to be a disciple and make disciples. And I know that sounds intimidating. It sounds overwhelming in the reality of things. But rest assured this, that salvation, true conversion is an event. Discipleship is a lifelong process that will cost you everything. So the second that, what does this mean? So the second that you respond to Jesus... You heard the voice, come follow me, and you lifted your hand. We need to understand what you did. Is that really what you said? You were acknowledging to God that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. You were basically repenting, means to turn away. He says to repent of your sins. You are repenting from your old sinful lifestyle. You are turning away from that old life. You're turning away from the world, and you are turning to God. And then at that moment, you are considered as a true conversion experience. It is a heart transformation. It's you can't be, you can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't give your money away enough. You can't do good things. No, a true conversion experience has to do with the transformation of our heart that says, listen, God, I'm so sorry for the sin. I'm going to turn. I'm going to repent and I'm going to go the other way. And matter of fact, I want to submit to you that if you claim to be a Christ follower, but you continue to make sin a practice, then according to the word of God, you do not belong to the family of God. And you want to come back next week because I don't have enough time to jump into that today. But next week's only going to be for people who really want to see what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because we're going to take a look and define what it truly means to be saved. 
What it truly means to either you're a child of God, if you want to study, go to 1 John 3, chapter 9, I think. If you want to study, it says you're either the children of God or you're a children of the devil. I don't think y'all ready for next week. I like today, though. (laughs) I want to talk about today. (laughs) Where are we? What was I talking about? Okay, yeah, here we go. Okay, but understand, from the point you have a true conversion experience, that you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you're called to follow him. That means being a disciple. We learned from week number two, Pastor Kerry taught us that a disciple is, is, is based off a Greek word, method, it is something. You need to go study that because I can't pronounce it. But it means that you're a student <laughs> and you're a learner. You become a student, a learner. That's why you're coming. We open up God's word. We learn about it. And then you become a teacher and you make disciples. How do we do that here at the house church? We think it's a process. We call it the three B, the four Bs. Believe, belong, become, and be the church. We just believe, first of all, that God wants you to believe to have a true conversion experience and family understand that word believe implies something more than what you think. It, it implies that God actually does want something more for us than to say a prayer down to the, the church. He doesn't just save you for yourself. He saves you for a reason. And we're going to take a look at what it truly means to believe next week. But after you have the true conversion experience, you belong spiritually to the family of God. God wants you to belong to a local body of believers. He wants you to belong to a church. I mean, you doesn't have to be here. I love this. Hey, hey, will y'all just say thank you to this good-looking stud and his wife, Pastor Josh and Jesse. They're amazing. What was I saying? Belong. Okay. So God wants you to belong to a local body believer. And I love this church. I'm by, I think it's the greatest church in the world. I just do. But it doesn't have to be here. But God wants you to belong to a, a, a body of believers. And many people, they're good with that. But he doesn't want you to stop there. Because God, we believe it's a spiritual journey that God wants to take us on. Because after we believe and we belong, then he wants us to become. He wants us to become a disciple, become everything that God created you to be. He wants to set you free from the addictions in your life. He wants to give you freedom from your past and the sins and things that have been weighing you down, that have been keeping you from being and living the life that God has called you to live. (laughs) Thank you. That was a pretty smooth transition. (laughs) Chicken, 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 what? (laughs) Word. Word. To become, he wants to set you free. Why? Because he has a purpose for you. He has a plan to use your life. Many people don't know that God gave you a personality for a reason. That if you're an extrovert and you're outgoing, it's for a reason. You're not a bad person. You just love people. If you're an introvert, you can't help that either. You don't really like people. No, I'm just joking. But it's for a reason. But only to give you a personality, he gave you some gifts. He gave you spiritual gifts to use. And here's the most beautiful thing. When you discover your personality and you discover your spiritual gifts and you use those to make a difference for God, that is when real fulfillment will happen in your life. That's what we know will lead to the fourth thing, which is to be the church. We believe that God has called us to not just stay in our gift, to not stay in our purpose, but he wants us to use those gifts to be a servant. Everybody say servant. And that is what I want to talk to you today. When it comes to true followers of Jesus, they serve and they serve with the right attitude. They serve with the right attitude. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today because this has the power to change your life. It has the power to change your relationships. It has the power to change your spouse, your wife, your husband's relationship. It has the power to change your kids. It has the power to change your job, your boss. Really. It has the power to change people that don't like you and that people that you don't like. And I like to say this, it is the secret to true success. Jesus taught it this way, is that the pathway to greatness is servanthood. That's what Jesus taught. So if you'll go ahead and turn in your Bibles now to John chapter 13. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you're in Matthew, you just turn to the right. Ooh, I almost turned to it on the first flip, y'all. I'm getting so much faster. 
last time, I, last service, I forgot to turn it, like, get there, and it took me a while. And, and, and as you guys are getting there, again, it's just New Testament. It's John. John was one of the disciples who lived with He saw Jesus three and a half years. He actually saw and witnessed the account of Jesus' life. He didn't write about it from a third party. He lived it and he saw it. So here in this story we're about to read, the, the table is, 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 the setting is a table. And there are all kinds of people. The disciples are around this table and Jesus is around this table. And they're all eating food. And guess what? The disciples are focused on themselves. Matter of fact, they're so focused on themselves. Instead of talking about serving each other, they're arguing about who's the greatest amongst them all. And then you have Jesus at this table. And yet, you know what's on his mind? Others. He's thinking, even though he knows this is the last week of his life, you know, he is just literally hours away from dying. He's thinking about others. And he's thinking, listen, man, I have these, these guys have been with me for three years and they don't get it. They have got to get this before I go on. And here we are in John chapter 13, uh, verses 1. We know this as the Last Supper, but he says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved the disciples during the ministry on earth, and now he loved them even to the very end. Why did it say, and he loved them even now? Because if you don't know the story of Jesus and disciples in the last week, his disciples betrayed him. They weren't there for him. And he still loved them. He loved them in the ministry, and now he's saying, I love them to the very end, a bunch of jacked up people who let him down. And then he goes on, he says, and it was time for supper and the devil have already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father, or yeah, Jesus knew the father that had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So Jesus knew his purpose was about to, it was coming to a close. So he got up from the table He took his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. So you have Jesus, he's already starting to set the example of what a true follower of him looks like, which is servanthood. Now if you'll go to Matthew chapter 20, please. Go to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to be in verses 26 through 28. You go back to the left. Matthew, Matthew was a little tax collector. (laughs) Thanks, Josh. I was on tune today, singing worship. I'm just telling y'all. Thank you, aunt. Thank you, my brother. So what is Jesus saying? What, What is he implying from the table to Matthew? It's this right here. In verse I can't read it. I think it's 26, but it says, but among you, it will be different. What does he mean different? Because up to that point, the Jewish, the Pharisees and the Romans, they lorded over people. They they were mean. They expected people to serve them. And Jesus said, "Uh, but among you, it's going to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, true disciples serve Jesus and they serve him with the right attitude. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we started taking taking a look at a couple words, how words have changed its meaning over time. And one of the words we took a look at was goat. Everybody remember? Goat used to be a farm animal, right? Now it represents the greatest of all time. And I know that there's a lot of debate amongst the greatest of all time, especially in the sports arena. For instance, when it comes to golf, is it Jack Nicklaus or is it Tiger Woods? I think it's Jack Nicklaus, hands down. Okay. Okay. When it comes to basketball, everybody should know this one. Is it Michael Jordan or is it LeBron James? Michael Jordan, hands down. And again, you have the right to be wrong. That's okay. And I'm right. Magic wasn't bad. And Larry Bird. Larry Bird was my boy. Growing up, I used to shoot free throws into a trash can because of Larry Bird. I got to move on. I'll always do this second service. Be quiet, aunt. (laughs) 
So the greatest of all time, but you know when it comes to the greatest man that has never lived, there is no debate. There is no anybody next to him. The greatest of all time is none other than Jesus Christ. See, he was the ultimate example. He just didn't talk the talk. He walked the walk. He was the greatest example when it came to what true, what it truly meant to be a child of God, what it truly meant to surrender your life to a cause and a purpose greater than yourself. And Jesus taught that the pathway to success was servanthood. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know what? If you want to be the best, I think everybody in here should be, want to be the best at whatever you're doing. I think God places inside of every single one of us to be the best that we can be. But here's the truth. I don't think we have to find greatness accurately today. I don't think we have because Jesus taught greatness. The pathway to greatness is something totally different than the culture of this world today. That the culture's world says it's all about me, me, me. Jesus says it's all about give, give, give. That there's, those are totally different thought processes here. But Jesus is the greatest of all time. And here we are in this story. Jesus has taken time again out of his life. He's literally hours away, hours away from dying. And he takes some time to say, man, these guys missed it. I've got to do something. You serve and you become great. It will always be that way. So I want to give you four steps. How do I do that, Pastor? How do I become a servant of Jesus? I want to give you four, four things today. The first of all, it's this. Man, you've got to start where you are. When it comes to being a servant, you just got to start somewhere. You know, the second you had a true conversion experience, your salvation experience was an act of faith. You took a leap of faith and you surrendered your life to God. So now God saved you for a purpose. He forgave you for a purpose. In Ephesians 2.10, in the NIV translation, it'll be on the screen overhead. You don't have to turn there. But it says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So understand, you aren't saved by your works, but you are saved for the works of God. That, that, he, that he says that you no longer need to pray about it. You no longer need to say, well, I just need a word from God. I need to hear a word from God to whether or not I'm going to serve. No, no, he says wherever you're at, no matter what your position is, you've got to start with the attitude that you are a servant. He wants you to serve, and I want you to think about your sphere of influence. Think about the influence you have in your home, at your job, the influence you have in your community. Think about the influence that you have here at the house church. Think about that, and Jesus says no matter your position, it doesn't matter if you're paid to do something or you volunteer at something. It doesn't matter. You are a servant. And if you don't start with an attitude that you are a servant, you're going to have a hard life. You're going to let your life be designed the wrong de definition of greatness. He always says it starts with servanthood. Colossians 3.23. I want to go ahead and go there. Where's Colossians. Where? Oops, I'm in Revelation. It's right after Philippians, right? Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, Philippians, Colossians. Hey, my book, A Big Old Deal, you can't miss it. It says Colossians. So I want to go ahead and read Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 23 and 24. Everybody there? Say, I'm a servant. This is what he says. He says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. That's what he's saying right there. You're not working for men. You're not working for your boss. You're not serving for me or the pastors of the church. Man, you're serving God. And he says, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. And that the master you are serving is who? It's Christ. That's what we have to take the attitude that I'm a servant, that I'm not working for man, that I'm working for God. And if I have that attitude, then God's going to give me an inheritance. And this is what I know. All successful people are helping other people succeed. They just are. Again, you want to you have a successful life? You know the secret to success? Find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. 
and find a problem and solve it. Amen. Don't just complain about it. Don't just complain about things. Find a solution to things. And guess what? Part of that solution should be you. Don't just expect for other people to fix the problem. Don't just be critical and point out everything was wrong. Come with some real solutions to it. He's called us to serve. And here's the truth. You can either position yourself in a position to be a giver, or you can position yourself to be a taker. But rest assured of this, the pathway to success will always come through serving. Think about our marriages, those people who come into a marriage with the thought process of what can this marriage do for me? You already got a, a strike against you. You have a wrong attitude. You're, you're coming, you're, you're, not, you're not thinking about marriage serving a higher purpose of holy, the, the, the sacred romance that said God, hasn't, God didn't bring you together to make you happy, but to make you holy. And when your marriage doesn't serve a higher purpose, you quickly become frustrated. And you'll start pointing fingers, and you'll start making lists, and you're start saying, well, you're the problem with our marriage. You do this, you do this, and you do that. You know what? Because your heart has never been to give, it's always been to take, take, take. And when two selfish people get married, and it's all about them, it's disastrous. It's going to end disastrous. God has not called us to be takers. He's called us to be givers. Let's, t- talk, let's talk about our kids. Do you know that we should teach our kids to serve? Can I get an amen? Isn't that something that's lost in our society today? It is. And parents, if you do everything for your children all the time, they will never understand and learn what it means to serve, and they will never understand what it means to look out for other people's needs. As all you do is do things for them, you will raise a child who is entitlement, who will walk around complaining about everything, saying, my food is too cold. (laughs) Or you messed up my service. Or my iPad won't work. Or moms that you slave over your kitchen and you work crazy to cook a meal that you put your heart and soul to just to have an ungrateful kid say, well, I don't want green beans tonight. Or chili. (laughs) Amen. Word. Shoot, we tell our girls, you ain't got, I'm serious. They started doing it. We started telling Journey Camry, you don't got to eat. I'm dead honest. They don't got to eat if they don't want to be grateful and like it. I'm telling you, we need to teach our kids how to serve. Teach our, when you go to a restaurant, when when you you get up to leave, don't just throw your trash away. Look for other people's trash that were too lazy to throw it away. Because you think it's somebody else's job paid to do that. Let's start teaching them to serve. Start teaching them the plastic trays that are left behind. Before you, how about you, hey girls, let's, let's, or boys, hey, let's take this tray. Let's serve them. You know what? How about in your home? Teach your kid to serve in your home. You know, how about at this church? How about teach your kids to serve at the church to start taking care of the house of the Lord? How about teaching them to pick up trash? It's not the cleanest team's job to pick up your trash. Stink your stinking trash and throw it in the trash can. But teach your kids to start taking it and picking it. How about this? When they go to the bathroom and they make a mess in there and there's water all over the place and soap, how about teach them to take a paper towel and clean off the sink so it gets ready for the next person? See, what I'm telling you, there's a difference. We've got to raise our children, and this is what I know. Parents who model serving, they produce kids who learn to serve. And hear me this. A kid that learns how to serve, they will always have a future, and they will always have a job because people are looking today not for some employees. They're looking for a family. They're looking for some servants, some people that won't just say, well, you owe me something instead of I'm getting to serve you. See, it is a privilege to serve and not an obligation. And we've got to teach our kids how to serve. We've got to model this in our homes, and we have to do it with the right heart. See, every single one in your household, you should serve your family. You should serve your kids, and your kids should serve you. Every single one of us that call this place home, we should serve each other. Every one of us have a role to serve in this church. See, every great marriage has a great serve. Every great family has a great serve. Every great leader serves. And Jesus in his word says, 
true followers of me will serve and they'll do it with a good attitude. Not, not because they're doing it for a man, but they're doing it for God. And leads to the second point, because I want us to go back to the story, because here's Jesus, they're at this table. The disciples are arguing about who's the greatest, and they're so self-focused. And this is what Jesus does. He pushes himself back away from the table. He gets a towel. He gets a basin full of water, and he kneels down, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And I think, and at least the point number two, which is this, you have to use what you have. You've got to start where you are, and you have to use what you have. Jesus was king of using his environment and things around him to preach the gospel. And I think here's Jesus sitting at his table again with his disciples. He's about to die, and they're arguing. They're so selfish, and Jesus says, my God, they still don't get it. I've got to do something to get them to understand. And this is, again, I want to read Ephesians 2.10 again, but in the NLT this time. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, meaning he saved you. The Bible says when you get saved, the old is gone, the new has come. And he says he saved you and knew. And then it goes on and says, so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. In other words, God has some work for you to do, family. It's time for work. Write this down. Because I think there's a lot of people today who just say, Pastor, I'm just not good enough to serve God. I'm not good enough to serve in his church. Write this down. God wants to use what you have, not what you don't have. Hear this. God wants to use who you are, not who you're not. The only thing he asks you is, will you do what I do with what I gave you and then trust me to do the rest? Do you know that is the story of this church? Is a group of people who just, this is who we are. And we're going to do the best we can with what we have in God. We're going to trust you. And that's how we'll always be here at the house church for everybody. You know who I think a great example of this is in in the Bible is Moses. See, Moses was the one that God called and said, listen, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. That's what he said. And and how did Moses respond in Exodus 3.11? He started making excuses. Who am I? He started telling God a bunch of reasons why that God should choose somebody else to do what God had called Moses to do. Who am I? He said. See, he he thought that God was looking for a polished communicator. See, he thought God was looking for somebody who had everything put together because he said, God, I'm I'm just, I stutter. Who's going to want to listen to me? And then God says, Moses, what do you have in your hand? He's trying to get Moses to see. This isn't about you, Moses. Because I'm about to display my power to the world in a way that never has been shown before. I'm not looking for people who are put together. I'm just looking for people who will be obedient to me. Matter of fact, I think God chooses you people who aren't put together, who have a humble heart with a great attitude over somebody who thinks you're God's gift to ministry. He's all about humble hearts in our soul. And then, and then I think we are just like Moses in a lot of ways. God has called every single one of us to do stuff, and this is what we do. We just start giving God a bunch of lists of why, God, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. And we throw it up to God, and if you could just hear God say, you just don't get it. I'm not looking for somebody else. I made you. I gave you everything that you need. I just need you to be obedient and do what I ask you to do. Ouch almost fell. And think about this. God always uses, throughout Scripture, He uses ordinary people to do big things. He took some fish and, and some, some loaves of bread, and He fed 5,000 people. He, he told some people to take some, some barrels at a, at a wedding and put some water in, and He turned it into wine. He told Moses to let your people, he said, Moses, what do you have in your hand? He says, it's a staff. He said, hold it up in there, put it over the Red Sea. And he parted the waters. 
And God's people walked on dry land. See, see, we think that God all uses the, the amazing things to display his greatness. You can take this to the bank. God uses ordinary things to display his greatness. So all glory and honor goes through him and not through an arrogant man. And I think we just make serving God more complicated than what it should be. I really think we tend to over-spiritualize it. I think we overthink it at times. I, th- I think we think serving God means something big, but we fail to see the small acts of serving. And I just want to say again, the only thing God asks us is, will you do what I ask you to do with what I gave you and then trust me to do the rest? So I want you guys to understand the importance of God has called you to serve people in the church and outside of the church. But I want you to understand today the importance that God has called every single one of us who call the house church home. He has called every single one of us to serve in this house. And not through my opinion, I want to show you through scripture. If you turn to the book of Romans, again, that's go back to the left. That is after Acts. I'm getting so good. I'm so impressed with myself. God isn't, but I am. Sorry. So here we go. Romans 12. Again, we're picking up from where we left off last week. Because Romans 12 talks about how we are, an, we are a holy sacrifice. That we have offered ourselves to God as a holy sacrifice, set apart, making sure we are acceptable and pleasing to God. He said that your, your temple is the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, that, that you were actually bought at a price. And because I have something for you to do. And in Romans 12, chapter or verse 4, this is what he says. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. We belong to each other. I belong to you. You belong to me, my friend. That was my addition right there. And it says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. And then he goes on in verse 9, he says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Don't just pretend to love me, really love me. That's what God just told you to do. I didn't respond as good as the first service, so I hope you really love me. I know. Thank you. I love you too. Okay. So, hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Then my favorite one of them all, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. You need to understand what Paul, he's not talking about you serving outside the church. He's not talking about Samaritan's Purse and serve days and 821. And although I think we are called to do that, this passage here is for the body of believers. It's the body of Christ that God has given every single one of us some form of gift. Every single one of us have a role to play in serving God's church, which leads to the third thing. So the first thing, you got to start where you're at. You got to use what you have. And the third thing, you need to put your heart into it. You need to put your, you need to give everything you have into serving God. Again, Colossians 3.23, we've already, everybody wanted to get whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Again, although that, that the pastors of the church, we are responsible for the day-to-day business activities. We are responsible for the systems that are put in place that make the church operate. We have a dream team. We have leaders that we have placed over those ministries. And then you have everybody else that comes around them to serve voluntarily. You're volunteering your time to show up to say, listen, I want to serve and I want to honor, not buck the system. Word, that's new. Sorry, that was new, wasn't it? So understand that we all have a role. It's all about unity. We all come together. We all have a purpose. Why? You don't do it to get something. You don't do it because, well, well, if I do this, then pastor, you're going to owe me something. You should not serve with strings attached. Because in 1 Samuel 12, 24, it tells us, but be sure to fear the Lord. And faithfully serve him. Why? Think of all the wonderful things that he has done for you. That's why you serve him. You don't serve to get him to love you, to get more stuff. You serve him because he died for you. And then out of your love of God, once you come to the revelation that you are a horrible, terrible, dirty person who rejected God, that he still chose to die for you, that he still wants to use you, sometime in your walk with God, you've got to go from being a consumer to a contributor in the kingdom of God. You've got to go to God. I don't have to do this for you. I want to do this for you. I want to give you my life. I want to offer my life. You want me to park cars or park cars? You want me to work in the kids' ministry? I work in the kids' ministry. You want me to stand on one foot and say hi to people? I will, but people will think I'm weird. You want me to change diapers? I might throw up, but I'll do it. You have to come to a point, know that God has called you to serve. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to get a word from God. He's, that's what he's called you to do. You just got to have a heart to want to do it. And you know what? It doesn't even take a lot of, oh, I'm way ahead of myself. I want to not get there yet. <laughs> Family, isn't that the least that we can do? Is serve God because he saved us. And, and hear me when I say this. The attitude at which you serve is everything. Attitude is huge. Jesus said this way that our attitude should be like his own. Which Jesus says, I didn't come to serve. Or I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And that's our attitude. I'm going to spend a little time here. Do you know that the secular business world, the retail businesses, understand the importance of serving and doing it with a great attitude? When you think of Walmart, when you think of TJ Maxx, when you think of Target, they have a whole department dedicated to what? With a big old sign. It says Customer Service Department. They understand the importance of serving. Why? Because we all have had those encounters with people who hate their job. And we've had encounters with people who love their job. And how do you know that whenever you love your job, that it is contagious when people see you smiling and loving your job, that it is contagious. And I want you to know in the business world, man, before I went into the ministry, I was involved in three network marketing businesses. I helped climb to the comp of the compensation letter and to, in all of them. I had a sales team, and I want you to know that everybody on the sales team, they were all part of customer service. It didn't matter if they were behind the scenes. It didn't matter if they were out front working with the customer. They were all part of the customer service department because when you think about this, people aren't just experiencing a product. They're, exper- they're, they're, they're buying an experience, and that's why so many people go to chick a fil It's chick a fil Hey, I'm preaching. I get to say whatever I get want to say. But I don't know, but their chicken sandwich is good, but you don't go there to get chicken sandwiches. You go there because the service is exceptional. They're amazing. They serve. They stand out in the cold and the heat, and they take your order. Even though you're five cars behind and you still don't know what you're going to get, and you get up to the window, and they're like, may I take your order? I don't know. Let me think about it. (laughs) But they still serve. They still have a good smile on their face. When you go sit in the restaurant, they're picking up your trash. Can I get you anything? Man, even the secular world understands the important. When it comes to a company... They understood if the culture and the priority is serving and serving with a great attitude, then the sky's the limit. 
but they also understand if the culture, if you have a sour attitude, if you think just because you're behind the scenes that you can complain and gripe and grumble, what you just did is you just cut their potential. You just limit the capacity of that company. But more than that, you just limit your capacity. You just put a lid on yourself. That's the secular world understands. But can we talk about the church? Let's talk about God's church. Because the stakes are so much higher. Are so much higher. I want every single one of you to know here, and every Jesus wants every follower of Jesus and every church in the United States of America to understand that if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you're a soul winner. Every single one of us are part of God's customer service team. Every one of us. We all have a role to serve. We all have a purpose to serve. And we got to get away from serving man, and we got to get back to serving God and doing it with a good attitude. Anything is possible when you hold back generosity and you hold back your gifts and you have a bad attitude and you get hurt and you don't handle it the right way. I want you to know we have just limited our potential. We just put a cap on us as a church to reach our city and our community and our state for Jesus Christ. We just have. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells us this way. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I'm going to read it because I'm running out of time. It says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I, too, try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. So what he's saying, I mean, we've got to put our heart into service God. That everything we do should be for the glory of God. And the spirit at which we do this will determine our ability to reach people far from God. And I just want to stop here and just say thank you to our amazing dream team. If you're just new, our dream team consists of men and women and youth. People who serve. They serve faithfully. They're committed. Many have done it for years. I truly want you to know that our dream team is the heart and soul of this church. Although we have the procedures, if you don't have a group of people to serve and serve with good attitudes, the church doesn't work. That's the way God entitled it to be. And we have a, there are men and women, I'm telling you, you guys have served with such a heart after God. You have done it for God and you have done it amazing. And I want you to know because of that, God has breathed on this house and it has nothing to do with the charisma of a leader. It has to do with your ability that when you come to this place, you bring the Spirit of God with you. Not a style of worship, not a style of preaching, not because the donuts are gluten-free, fat-free, and sugar-free. And I lied. That's not why. It's because you have a heart to serve. And you have a heart to do it for God. And I want to say thank you for that, but I also want to ask some of you who aren't serving, Why aren't you? I don't want you to really think about it. I was going to ask you to pray about it, but I don't think you have to pray about it. I think you just need to know that God has called you to serve. But Because here's the deal. Although we have over 100 people serving, we're still down in numbers. And I worry about this. I worry about burnout. We have men and women who serve every single Sunday, sometimes both services. And even though there's 100 people on our dream team, there's still 400 people who are actively called this place home. Can you imagine if we had 300 people, if we had 200 people serving? There would never be burnout in our church. Do you know that we have the most amazing kids ministry volunteer team on the planet? Will you just give it up for them? They're amazing, mom and dad. But some of them, because we're so down in numbers... They work both services. Some don't even get to ever attend a service. And I want you to know there's other areas that you can serve in, and you don't have to be gifted in everything. Now, to get on the worship team, listen, if you can't carry a tune, Josh isn't going to going to let you on the platform. I love to sing. I love to worship. I could force my way and say, I'm the pastor. Put me up there. But that would be selfish of me. Because I'm not doing this for me. What I'm doing is so that many can be saved. 
We all have a role. We all have gifts and talents. Even when it comes to parking cars, you don't have to have a PhD. We have some smart people who came up with geometry. You know that there's a way that they park you for a reason so you can get out in this place without having a wreck? Really, when it comes to parking cars, you just got to have a right heart. Because when people buck you and not park where you want to park, you can't throw rocks at them. I still don't understand why people buck a parking team. We're trying to save you from having a wreck. Serving donuts, opening door, opening a door and greeting. That doesn't take a lot. It just takes somebody that says, I'll do it. And I'm just asking you, God needs us. He needs every single one of us serving in some capacity, in some way. Why? Because the stakes of God's church are higher. Hear me. People's souls are more important than anything that you and I do in the secular world. It's more important than our feelings. It's more important than your ability and your reason that you think that you can gripe and you can complain and you can grumble about things. People's souls are more important than anything that we do. So turn, go to John 13. I'm out of time, but I'm just going to read it to you. It says, after washing their feet, he put on a robe again and he sat down and he asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher. You call me Lord. So in other words, you say you're a Christian. You're saying that you're a follower of Jesus. And you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, are you ready? Here it goes. You ought to wash each other's feet. See, he's saying we've got to learn to serve, and we've got to learn to serve to do it with the right heart. Jesus, chapter 15 says, I was giving you an example to follow. Do as I've done to you. When you think about what Jesus did, what did he do? He served a bunch of undeserving people. And this is a hard pill for me to swallow when I hear it, when I see it. It's easy for me to serve people who are nice to me. It's easy for me to serve you when you serve me. But it's when people I think are undeserving to serve, I don't want to serve them. When you hurt me and you attack me, and you call me friend, but you gossip behind my back, it's hard for me to want to serve you. It's something that I really have to pray about. I just want to be honest with you. I have to ask God, help me, Lord. But this is God gave me a revelation. I've read this a lot of times within the last two months. And at that table, when Jesus knelt down to wash the feet, you know whose feet one of the people Jesus washed? Was Judas Iscariot. See, Jesus washed the feet of the one who was responsible of nailing Jesus' feet to the cross. See, Jesus washed the feet of undeserving people despite their past, despite their issues, despite their flaws, despite what was going on. Jesus served others. And that is what he has called us to do is to serve others. And what Jesus was simply trying to do, he was trying to deposit a foot-washing spirit into people, into his disciples, with the right attitude to serve him. And family, I'm telling you, if you don't get the foot-washing spirit inside of you, if we don't do what we're talking about today, you will always find a reason to complain. You will always find a problem no matter where you go to church, no matter where you go, you will always be critical of me. You will always be critical of a church. If this church, and I'm going to tell you in 20 years of ministry, what I've learned about the church when pastors lose their way and when congregations lose their way is because they forget what it's about. They make it about them. They make it about what you're supposed to do for me and what, what I'm supposed to do for you. And then we forget that it's all about God. It's all about Him. Everything that we do is all about him. And if you'll turn to James, where's James again? Oh, I turned right there. I'm the bomb. I just want to help some people when it comes to griping and complaining and grumbling because we all do it. Can we just be real? But this is what he says in verse 9 of James 5. He says, don't grumble about each other. Brothers and sisters, or you will be judged for look, the judge is standing at the door. 
You can grow up and you can't complain, but you need to know that your judge is standing at the door. And what we have is an opportunity as a family to come together and put aside our issues and the complaining, and we have an opportunity to come together and hear me. If God's local body, if the global church would quit griping and complaining, the church would be a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates will be able to prevail against it. But as long as we gripe and we complain and we don't have a foot washing spirit and we blame everybody for all the problems, we're always going to give Satan a foothold and an opportunity to come in and destroy the very thing that God has left me and you to protect. It's to serve his church, which leads to the fourth thing. You need to take a step forward. You need to do something with it. You, need them, you want your life to count for more than just making money, for more than just playing games, for more, just, for more than vacations. You want your life to matter more. Jesus said, just knowing these things now. Now that you know it's not enough to know, I want you to do something. And then John, you can, you can go read it. And John, it says that, 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 that you are too. Oh, John, it says that God will bless you for doing what I ask you to do. And see, when you do the right thing with the right heart, everybody wins. But when you do the right thing with the wrong heart, you lose. You lose your joy. You lose your purpose. You use the ability to have community with other believers. And that's not what God wants for you and I. He wants us to serve and have purpose and be happy. And maybe you're here and you're struggling with this. Maybe you have an offense. Maybe you have a hang-up. But you just, man, I want to serve. I just got a problem with you, Pastor. I just got a problem. Maybe you need to pray a prayer like David, a Psalm 51 prayer that says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit inside of me. Do you know that I have to pray that prayer every single day before I leave my home? As a pastor, I get attacked on a daily basis and I have to ask God, God created me a clean heart, oh God. I don't want how people treat me for me to respond in a negative way. God forgive them for they know not what they do. See family, that's the opportunity we have. And I don't have to convince those of you who are serving that it's better to be a giver than a receiver. But I would ask some of you who aren't, man, if you'll you'll think about serving in some capacity because true disciples of Jesus, they serve His church and they serve with a great attitude in some way. We have a growth track that you can go to, that you can discover your personality, your gifts, your talents. We put every ministry here that's something that we can partner you with that you can be fulfilled in doing. My prayer is that we would rise up and we would be that church. Would you stand at the prayer team? We'll go ahead and come on down, Father. God, right now, we just want to spend a few moments with you. Lord, we ask that, uh, God, that you open our heart and our minds. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here, God, that is hung up with something, God, that they'll be able to lay it at your feet today. God, that they'll be able, that healing will begin to happen. I pray that people will begin to see dreams and visions again, Lord. But God, we just want to spend a few minutes with you and do heart surgery on us in Jesus' name. If you need prayer, go ahead and step on out.
Jesus even says that nobody comes to the Father through me. But if you continue reading, he says, nobody comes to me unless the Father draws them. And we know that the Father is using his Holy Spirit to bring people into a relationship with Jesus. Pastor, I feel it going on. There's something going on inside of me. What is it? Is God calling you? Well, how do I do it? Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess him as Lord, that God is looking for true lordship. He's looking for you to surrender your life to him as best as you know how. It's not that you'll be perfect all the time. It's not that you'll never sin. But hear this, you will sin less because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and he'll bring conviction and he'll remind you that I have something so much better for you than that old life. And then he says, believe in your heart that you are who you say you are, that he's the Messiah, that he died on the cross for our sins and he was put in a tomb. And three days later, he rose from the grave. The Bible says at that point that you will be saved as far as the east is from the west, that Jesus, by his blood that was shed on the cross, that he will forgive you and he will cleanse you and he will write your name in his Lamb book of life. And from that moment forward, Jesus will come in and he'll start the process of the rest of your life of becoming more like him every single day. So on the count of three, if you're here and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm going to simply ask you to lift your hand. Man, I'm not going to call you out. That's not, this is between you and God. Maybe you walked away and for whatever reason you're here today and you're saying, man, I'm ready to make a fresh commitment to my Heavenly Father. It doesn't matter, but on the count of three, if that's you, if you simply lift your hand, it'd be my honor to lead you in a prayer of the beginning of the rest of your life. One, two, and three. Does anybody say, that's me, Pastor B? Yes, I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Oh, wow. I see it. I feel it. I sense the Spirit of God is moving. He's going to and fro, and he's looking for people who are hungry. He is about to fill you with his spirit. He said the old is gone and the new has come. He's about to deposit a purpose and a soul and a spirit and a life inside of you. It's going to be the most exciting life you've ever lived. Family, let's help and let's say this prayer together. And those of you who just acknowledged to your heavenly father, you need to know that he is smiling at you and he is so glad that you invited him in. So let's say this together. Say, Jesus, today I confess you as Lord. I'm giving you my whole life as best as I know how. Here it is, God. Take it. Use it for your glory. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are that you're the Messiah. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Thank you for that, Jesus. I believe you were put in a tomb. And three days later, you rose from the grave. And Jesus, I'm asking you right now, forgive me of all my sins. Don't just save me, but be my Lord and be my leader. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen, house family. Come on, give it up. Come on, all of heaven stuff. There's a party going on right now. There's some new hope, some new purpose, some new vision. Man, those of you who said yes to Jesus, if you would just text 405-504-3733, just text what's next. We'd love to connect with you. I love you, house family. Have a blessed week. Come back next week. We'll see you then.